Hey everyone, welcome to our next episode of the Think Beginning Not End uh, podcast live on LinkedIn. So great to see you guys. Um, just to get a few things off the top, we've got an amazing guest today and in fact it's going to be part of an 11 uh, series episode with none other than John Lee. So I didn't see John on the first episode, I won't go and watch that one again. You can see it um, up there in my profile on LinkedIn, you can simply click on it. And, um, and have a look at that. Or you can go to the YouTube channel as well. This is cast live across uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, and uh, and also Facebook. Um, guys, just to remember, the LinkedIn platform is still in the testing phase, so there may be a few technical um, problems that we might have. Um, so far, so good. If there's any issues with the volume um, or the audio, please let me know. And just so you guys know, during the broadcast, I do um, engage with you guys in the comments over here, particularly on LinkedIn. I will check Facebook and um, and YouTube as well. So um, I will be occasionally looking that way and uh, and engaging you guys on the comments. So first of all, thanks, Carol, for tuning in. I know it's 2 a.m. in the morning over there. And um, thank you so much for tuning in as always. Great to see you there. Thank you so much, Penny. Penny's joined us from Melbourne. Awesome to see you. Now, guys, without further ado, I want to introduce you again to John Lees. Now, uh, John and I have agreed to do an entire series for you guys. This is going to help everyone out there. It doesn't matter if you're in business, you're in a sales role. It doesn't matter what your role is. This is going to help everyone. Um, hey, hey, Jenny, nice to see you on the Melbourne too. Great to see you. So the 11-part series um, is going to start today with John um, the first episode is Sell Pleasure First, Products and Prices Last. I'm going to bring John in the broadcast now. Um, so just give me a second as I get this right and I add John in down the bottom here. Um, it's really a great honour and privilege to have John. As some of you guys uh, might be aware, um, it, uh, I started listening to John's cassette tapes many, many years ago, almost um, I think it was um, at least... Uh, two years ago, we had a bit of a joke about that in the first episode, but I'm just bringing John in now. So sorry if I had a bit of a stutter there, guys. You should have uh, John up on screen now. Hey, John, so nice to have you on. Thank you so much for tuning in um, from California and joining us today. Thank you, Simon. I appreciate it. Um, so, John, um, again, for everyone who um, didn't get to see in the first episode, um, for those that don't know you, um, you know, you're an author of 13 books, among many, many other things. Um, John, can you give everyone a bit of background about yourself again very, very quickly before we jump into today's topic? Sure. I, um, <clears throat> you know, started off um, as a young guy in my mid-teens in the UK working for my father, who was the manager of a shoe store. And it was very, very nice to have people come in and looking for help. And then at the age of 19, I became a sales rep for a multinational organization and not one customer wanted to talk to me. So that was a, a hell of a wake up call and a scare. Um, and I really thought maybe I've got into the wrong kind of job, but I got educated, not by management, unfortunately, because our senior managers at that time were all junior leaders. Um, and so uh, I, I was educated, if you like, by discerning customers. They told me what mattered to them the most, and that was the start for me. So I became a um, uh, senior, senior uh, rep, a major account rep. Then my wife and I went to Australia to follow the family and uh, started with the same company again as a sales rep, became sales manager. Um, and then eventually I was asked to join the Schwarzkopf organization, German organization that at that time had uh, grew up against giants, L'Oreal, Weller, fabulous companies, and uh, they were number one and number two, and I think we were like number four or five, uh, and within about five years, we became number one, um, simply because uh, we found out by meeting regularly with our customers, sell and owners, some small, some large, etc., cetera, um, where their real needs were, and their real need wasn't for getting supply of product. They could get that from anyone. You got one of the major suppliers shut down mm -hmm. all of a sudden, uh, they just go someplace else. Um, their real need was getting help with business. And that's when I first started going beyond my role at Swatskov. In fact, I resigned my role as marketing and sales director, became a consultant for the organization, and then Mr. Schwarzkopf, um in Germany invited me to become a global consultant for the company, working in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, 
the UK, South Africa, etc., uh, which I very much enjoyed. And then I went into my own business, uh, writing and speaking at conferences and doing training for organizations. And uh, I'm still doing quite a bit of training, mostly by Skype or Zoom. Uh, very much enjoy it still. And um, I hope everyone today enjoys what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Absolutely, John, and I'm sure they are. I'm just going to take another quick moment here just to quickly acknowledge some of the guys that have joined us here, uh, particularly just on the LinkedIn feed. And when John gets talking, just so you guys know, if I'm looking this way, I'm trying to um, engage you guys. So please make sure if you've got a question, throw it in there. I'll try and get that question to John as we go. Um, but again, uh, just very, very quickly, um, thank you, Gail Jackman, for joining from Adelaide. That's really cool. Thank you, Jenny. Um, a couple of tech issues Jenny's just said there, and uh, Deanne uh, from Albury in uh, New South Wales as well. So, John, um, what's the topic we're going to cover today? And then I'm going to take myself and pop myself up, up in the other corner there. I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, everyone out there, this is going to be some massive value in this, particularly in the current market and the current climate we find. That's one of the reasons um, you know, John and I wanted to present this on a weekly basis for you guys. So, John, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'll change the screen in a second. Um, and if you can give everyone a rundown on the topic we're going to cover today and then jump into it, straight into it for everyone. Okay. Well, it's based on a book that I wrote. It <laughs> first price last year. And uh, by the way, the people watching can get a copy of this, free copy of this. Um, all they have to do is send me an email. I'll give them the email address at the end. And I can send you a PDF version of this particular book. So pleasure first price last well, just think about a book. What is the attraction of a book? Is it the front cover or the back cover? The back cover describes the book and shows the price, but the front cover is the promise of satisfaction and interest to people. I don't know about you, but I've never been into a bookshop mm. and said, have you got any $10 thrillers? Um, I'm mostly interested in what's in it for me. So today we're going to talk about how to win business and how to keep an increasing business uh, with customers <clears throat> and also, of course, with prospects. And most of what I'm going to talk about is covered in the book. So I hope people find that to be of help. So you ready? John, that sounds great. Oh, yeah, let's let's get straight into this. I'm, I'm at, um, you know, one of the great things about this, and it's one of the reasons I, I like doing this, just for out there, as you guys are learning from John, so am I. So it's an absolute privilege to get someone on like John and, um, you know, I'm learning at the same time as you guys. So let's get straight into it, John. And just again, guys, if I'm looking to the right. I am engaging some comments, throw a few questions at John when we can. Over to you, John. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Simon, for coming up with this idea. It was your idea. You've made it happen. And I'm very grateful. And I'm sure the people watching appreciate that as well. Um, I hope everyone's well, um, despite all the problems that are going on around the world. Um, the only problem I had today is that I had an argument with my wife. Um, I simply said to her, I think we should fire our pool guy. And she said, you know what your problem is? You're getting older, you're getting senile, and you feel threatened by the presence of virile young men. That was what she said. What I said was, we don't have a pool. Um, just so that she understood where I'm coming from. So uh, let's get started. Um, First of all, we are going to uh, talk about um, the uh, situation behind the scenes. So here we have our customers. And uh, ordinarily, we would maybe call them A, B, and C. A terrible mistake that's made by lots of organizations, and the mistake had been made at Schwarzkopf when I arrived, so I had to change it pretty quickly, is that they considered A, customers to be the ones that bought the most. Um, and then B, customers only bought an average amount, whereas C, customers bought very little. That's a terrible way to do things. What we're looking for here is where is potential. So an A customer is the largest kind of customer. Whether they do business with you or not is another matter. So let's have a look. Okay, there's an A customer. There's a B customer, there's a C customer. And I hope you can see that they have a greater capacity for buying and using or reselling products. Theirs is also pretty good, but not as much as this. 
and here it's pretty small. Sometimes you find these people moving up the scale and so forth, but um, this is how we should be doing it. This is an A customer, this is a B customer, this is a C customer, and if we were starting business together today, um, we couldn't judge people on how much they buy. We'd have to judge them on their potential. Okay, so, <clears throat> so uh, number one, A equals large, B equals medium size business, C equals small. Okay, and then we have a second rating. And the second rating is one, two, and three. One is a very good customer. So they buy quite a lot from us. We do good business with them. A two is average success, average progress. And a three is very low, poor progress. So then what we have to do is have a two-dimensional view of our customers. A1, where they're buying quite a lot of stuff from us, we have a good relationship with them, and so forth. A2, where they're buying you know, some stuff from us. And an A3, where they're buying next to nothing from us. Um, so we have to be very careful here to make sure that we protect our business and continue to build it here, and the same here, and also the same here. Okay, and this is where we should be spending most of our time. And we should also be making sure that the people who do the selling are able to talk to this line of people here. Same with the Bs, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. Okay, exactly the same situation. B1s are buying quite a lot from us. Average here, very little here. Exactly the same situation down here. Uh, so what we have to do is if we are wanting to open new accounts with uh, people like the A3s and what have you, we have to understand that most of their business is with other suppliers, other vendors, whatever you want to call them. So we're going to be very careful about how we approach them. Okay, so... First lesson behind the scenes here before we go to market is to appreciate how we uh, differentiate the customers, okay? And here's the large ones in terms of three ratings, big buyers, average buyers, small buyers, all got the same sort of potential, basically, same here, but we have to make sure we do very well with them, continue to do well, don't allow them to become targets for your opposition, and then we're going to talk about how do we get in here, because it's not as easy as it looks. Okay, so let's go now to the second stage. Here's the market and all the money being spent. The more John just... I beg your pardon? Just jumping in, John. Um, if anyone's got any questions, please leave them in the comments here, and I'll, I'll try and ask John any questions as we go without interrupting too much. So just be aware, guys, if you've got a question, just throw it in there. We want to help you guys as much as we can. So sorry, John, back over to you. Uh, no problem. Okay, thank you. So here's the marketplace and the amount of money being spent on products or services. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're retail or if you are a supplier of goods to uh, the marketplace generally. Here's the dollars. Here are the suppliers. And you can bet your life that most of them have a fixation on trying to get a share of the business out there. Okay? Uh, very bad idea. Obviously, I know you want to get business out of here, but then we have to look at the larger picture. Okay? And the larger picture suggests that there's enormous amounts of potential. And if you watch the first um, session that uh, Simon organized, we talked about the first gap, which is contesting in this area here, which is extremely difficult. When I started as a rep, uh, nobody wanted to talk to me because they already had the products that they required. It was very, very difficult. And that's why I said discerning customers basically explained to me, this is where we want you to help us. The word potential is built on the word potent, latent power waiting to be released. And that's what we've got to learn to do, okay? We can't mess around with interfering down here. Uh, that's just a damn nuisance to people. What we've got to do is aim ourselves into this area here. 
So let's get talking about how do we do that. The first thing I'm going to show you is what I call code 213. It's just something for management and sales staff to remember. So here we go. Here's the market. <clears throat> the market has to buy Oops. Uh, products or services. Secondly, they have to sell or use products or services. And number three, they want consistent success with products. That's their ultimate aim. They're not looking for something that's a five-minute wonder. This is the situation for them. So now we take a look, thanks to Simon, we can take a large look now at the marketplace. And this is what most salespeople do if they're reps or whatever. Uh, 90, I would say 95% of salespeople who have a representative type role come in at this level here. This is level one. This is level two. This is level three. This is a disastrous approach, okay? Because not only are they not going to make sales, they're going to feel very depressed because no one wants to talk to them because they've got all the products and all the services that they require. And we have to imagine that they've got good suppliers. They've got a good relationship. So, you know, we can't get involved in selling interference. We have to sell improvement. So this is what happens. It's a terrible situation. And no wonder the market gets sick and tired of it and so forth. <clears throat> So, for instance, when I was at Schwarzkopf, I used to have reps contacting me, wanting to see if they could come and see me. And to be honest, I didn't really want to see them because I'd heard most of their stories. But there might be a better mousetrap out there. So what I used to do was I would say to any rep that called me, I'd be delighted to meet you. I was always nice to them. I don't like messing around and being insulting to people. So I would say to them, yes, come in, and uh, we'd organize a time. They would come in, and before they came in, I set my watch for five minutes into the interview. They didn't know that, of course. And then I would start and say, well, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming in. How can I help you? And then they would start. And 95% would start immediately telling me about the history of their company, the products they sell, and, uh, and then the watch would go off. Thank God. The alarm would go off. And, uh, and they would say, oh, uh, what was that? I would say, don't, oh, don't worry. It's just a reminder to me that I've got a meeting that I've got to go to in a couple of minutes. Are you able to basically uh, cut down to the main story here? Um, because, I, as I said, I've got to go in a few minutes. But they never could. Oh, well, one or two maybe here and there. But most of them couldn't do it. That was not their fault, by the way. This is not their fault. This is not their fault. This is management's fault. Sales staff dance to the tune of management. Okay, it's not fair for management to send people to the market without a worthwhile, interesting story. <clears throat> so, code 213 is what we do is we start here at number two. We go in and we say to people, I'm from, we do, I assume you've already got at least one supplier. I assume they're doing a good job. Nothing that I have to say today will interfere with your current buying arrangements. I'm only here to talk about opportunities that I hope you find to be of interest for your business. That's an enormous relief to people, okay, because they now know you're not going to get involved in doing all this, which is what most people do. So now we move to this area here, and we begin to talk to them about serious opportunities. And I will talk in a few minutes about a plan called the Staircase Sales Plan, which begins with a result that you believe can be achieved for them, depending on their size and one thing and another. So what we do is we start off by selling an opportunity here, selling progress, improvement, no, not, in, not interference. That's where we start. If they are interested in that, and most of them are, <clears throat> Uh, then we move to one, which is helping them to buy the products. And then we, cons then we uh, put our efforts into making sure that they get consistent success. When I go through the staircase sales plan later, you will see what I mean by making sure that this is covered and we don't leave it up to the customer. So code 213, very, very important. <clears throat> okay. Next, let's have a different view of the same subject. Jumping. 
for jumping quickly again. Um, just want to quickly say thanks to the guys watching over on YouTube as well. We've got some people watching on the on the YouTube channel as well as here on uh, LinkedIn Live. And, uh, yeah, as, as I start to get any questions through, I'll, I'll throw a few at you. Any time at all. And they can ask questions by email or whatever. Happy to help them. And, you know, at the start, yep. I always like to let people know I'm not a teacher of business. I'm a student of business. I'm in business every day myself. I love it. I mm. enjoy it. And uh, I'm learning all the time. And these are some of the things that I've been learning. So now we go Absolutely. to now we go to what's called or what I call the brick wall strategy. So here now is our view of the marketplace or a customer or a prospect. So uh, we have to make a guess. Where are they up to in terms of uh, progress? This is naught. Well, they won't be there unless they just open today. This is maximum. And not only will they not be there, they'll probably never be there because the line keeps going up. So the question is, where are they at? Well, we don't know, but we can make a guess. All good businesses mm -hmm. are usually at about 25 to 30% of where they could be. Okay, so let's say here's where we start. Okay, this is our view of the market. Very important for us, as with a military exercise, to know exactly what we're, what's waiting for us. And here we see that uh, we have this line here of performance, and we have to make a guess. But don't worry about whether you're right or wrong. What we do know is it won't be there and it won't be there. It's not likely to be up here. It's not likely to be down there. We're going to see people who want more success. So now this is the current situation. This is now. This is our guess as to where they are. It doesn't matter what the actual figure is. Then we make this and we make it look like a brick wall. Okay, now this wall has already been built. And if it's a prospect, it's already been built by someone else, by another company or a set of companies that they do business with. Okay, so very important for us to understand that when we go to see people, the first thing we do is acknowledge this here, okay? We do not attack under any circumstances. We let them know, as I said with Code 213, that I assume you've got good suppliers, uh, reliable suppliers, and, um, and that I'm also interested to know if you're obviously interested in progress, etc. Most uh, good companies are. So what I'm here to talk about is this area here. This is the area of potential. And so our story begins. And I'll come back in a minute to what the story is all about or should be all about. Okay, and we aim our idea into this area here, not to fill this area, but to perhaps get this amount of business here. And if we do that, then we're doing a damn good job. Okay, remember, we're not interfering with the status quo. Okay, so this is our part of the brick wall. And now we're in the customer's business. And once we're in the customer's business, we have two distinct opportunities. Here's the first opportunity. Number one, we can go further into this area here on a continuous basis. And number two, we can attack the status quo. You can only attack from the inside, not from the outside. Okay, so the brick wall strategy, which is mentioned in this book, makes it clear as to what our aim should be. Now, what you're probably thinking is, well, what are we selling? How can we sell a good idea to people? <clears throat> well, here's what we do. We get involved in what's called the success search. And John, it, John, is um, a common problem across all businesses is having that good idea, but then not being able to execute it fast for results. Say that again, sorry. What was uh, that again? Just a quick general question for everyone out there. You know, in business, you know, having having an idea and then being able to, to execute it fast in the marketplace, uh, you know, is obviously quite relevant. Um, so, you know, when you're asking yourself, you know, I've got a great idea, what am I going to do about it? Um, you know, I guess it's not only about, you know, um, putting it into practice, but being being able to have a strategy like this 
to go about um, putting it into the marketplace, but also probably being able to put it in the marketplace, you know, fast, I guess, because one of the things I notice is, you know, you can have good ideas, but if you don't execute on it, then it's not really worth anything. Absolutely, and, and neither is the person doing it. <clears throat> you know, we got to stay to our word. You know, I can't yep. tell you how many people that I talk to who say, okay, John, look, I'll call you maybe uh, Tuesday morning. Is that okay, about 11 o'clock? That, does that work for you, John? Um, just let me check. Yes, it does. It's That's perfect. Okay, thanks, John. I'll call you then. Okay, no call. No call whatsoever. Mm. Tuesday goes by. I ring them on Wednesday. Hi, Dave. Um, we were going to talk yesterday. Uh, everything okay? Oh, yeah. No, look, mate, I've been so flat out. I've been so busy. I just didn't have time. No apologies. I've just been so busy. That's pathetic. Mm. That is absolutely pathetic. Yep. So either we <laughs> we either know if we say we're going to do something, then we've got to do it, and we've got to do it in a professional manner. So the success search is absolutely critical, and I discovered this by accident. So I'm at Swaskov. I've only been there for, I don't know, maybe a month. And I'm going through some figures. Most of our business, by the way, was through <clears throat> salons. We did some business with pharmacies and so forth, very little business with uh, supermarkets. <clears throat> but anyway, I'm going through some figures, and we had one product called Bonnewell, which was a tube about that large, and uh, it, had, it was a, a treatment product. It was there to help uh, treat the hair uh, when it's had uh, color or any kind of chemical added to the, uh, to the hair. In those days, it was perms, uh, permanent colors, semi-permanent, the chemical factor, and so forth and so on. But we didn't sell much. We, we really didn't sell much. Um, but then I found one salon in Sydney uh, that sold an enormous amount of this product, an enormous amount, only one salon. The lady's name was Mary Ann Graham, and she had a salon in South Sydney. I double-checked the figures. They were extraordinary um, and consistent. So I then uh, called the rep <clears throat> and said, are you aware of how much this customer, Mary Ann Graham, is buying? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, so what exactly are they doing? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but, I, but I'm glad they're doing it. <sighs> Great. But, yeah, no idea. Absolutely no idea. So it just sows the seed there for what we're going to talk about here. He could not explain this to anyone else because he didn't himself know anything about it. He only was glad that he was getting the sales. Mm. And this is a reminder that in most organizations, the only thing that's measured is our sales, our progress. And I have no argument with that at all. It's absolutely vital. But why don't you learn to ma measure the customer's progress with your products or service? based on the most successful customers that you've got. Otherwise, what story do you possibly have for the marketplace? So I then rang the sales manager, the New South Wales sales manager, and uh, he vaguely knew she bought a lot, but he didn't know anything about it at all. So I rang Marianne Graham. I told her who I was, and I said, you are buying a disproportionate amount of this product called Bonnewell. What are you doing? Are you eating it? What are you doing? So she laughed, and she said, no, no. It just so happens that we... I tend to take the product very seriously. And uh, we have a lot of clients that have uh, chemical products and so forth. And we see it as an imperative, absolutely imperative, that they have a treatment service as well. The Bonnewell product, by the way, was not sold over the counter. It was a product used by the salon on behalf of the clients. Most salons had 2 or 3% of their sales with Bonnewell. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Didn't register at all. They had it on the shelf in case it was needed but they didn't do anything about it. So I said to this lady, you know, your sales are so large, so high, so consistent. What are you doing? And she said, well, uh, are you really interested to know? I said, of course I am. She said, okay, well then come to the salon because I'm not going to tell you over the phone. And I thought, damn, fancy having to leave the office. So we had a farewell party. I'll never forget it. And then I left the office and went to the market. And I went to her salon. And what I saw, what she had done, not with our help, by the way, on her own, what she had done was absolutely remarkable. She showed me everything that she did, the way she promoted it, everything. She didn't sell Bonnewell. She sold a treatment service, which was created by using Bonnewell. 
because if she used the product name and we went bust, she'd be in trouble because she'd have to go someplace else. So um, I said to her, that's just fantastic. She showed me how she promoted it, how the girls introduced it to the customers, how they charge for it, the whole thing. And I said to her, I'm the uh, head of sales in Swatskov. We have about 4,000 customers, and I want to let them know what you've done. Is it okay if I let people know what you've done? And she said, yes, it's okay, providing you don't tell the salon down the street. I said, fine, that's okay. So I then began the success search. Okay? In other words, the customer that did the best with our products. So let me show you what I mean. So um, we've got product A, let's say. <clears throat> In this case, it was Bonnewell. Then we go to the market and we study the market. And the market has very average purchases, which means very average sales. And then there are you know, a few that are a little bit better and so forth. And then just, just here and there, as with Mary Ann Graham, bang. Very high level success, very high level success, incredible success. And, you know, you'd find others as well that also had high level success, but not quite as high as hers. Now, what am I supposed to do with this information? I'm going to share it in a responsible manner with our customers. I'm going to arm our sales people with the story. And the story consisted, the success search consisted of four factors. And here they are. <clears throat> Number one. The result. That's what people are interested in. Okay, the result. And there, you, you mentioned the result that Marianne Graham was getting, and they would be absolutely shocked and amazed and, um, you know, incredible. We didn't expect, by the way, other salons to have the same figures as she did, but we did expect that they would improve what they were doing with our help because now the reps are not simply selling a product, as were our competitors. We're now selling a formula. Okay, so the first thing is the result. So remember that when we talk about the staircase sales plan. Number two, <clears throat> the motivation. Why did she get so involved with the product? What was her reasons for getting involved in the product and the service um, and so forth? And of course, it was all to do with her customers. She wanted to do the best she could for her customers. And she simply, on a gradual basis, went further than other salons. Other salons had the product somewhere and the service, but customers had to ask for it, which is ridiculous. Number three, the strategy. What did they do? What did they do? And in our case, it wasn't anything to do with us. Our rep had nothing to do with it. Our company, all we, we had was the product. And she then backed up the product by being serious. She got excellent results. That, of course, is the final factor. She was very motivated to help her customers. Without that, you've got nothing, by the way. Um, and then she started to introduce strategies and continuously improve those strategies. And then number four are the lessons that are learned by the customer and also by the organization. So what we then did is we, we introduced the success search as a key part of our business. Again, in a responsible, honest way, we went looking for the people, the customers who had the highest level of success with our product. That's, by the way, what happens with our kids when they want to get involved in sport. What are we supposed to do? Give them a lecture or show them films of the best athletes in the world, the best football players in the world, the best cricket player, whatever it happens to be. You know, they want to know about that. We don't always expect that they will get to that point, but they need this as inspiration and motivation to do better. They have evidence that it can be done. Okay, and that's what we got involved in. We got involved in the success search. <clears throat> so, uh, again, this is mentioned uh, here. And the success search then means that when you go to market... At level, um, remember I mentioned that you have the market here, 
One, two, three. What we do now is we start here. That's where we start. Um, after having acknowledged that they've already got suppliers and we're not there to interrupt or interfere with anything that they do. Okay, so the first thing is, here's the staircase plan. Number one, the result, the VM core, the goal. And of course, we have to work out that goal relative to the size of the business that we're talking to. It's not a complicated deal. But Marianne Graham had a smallish salon, but she had big ideas and she used them intelligently. If we went to other salons that were smaller, we'd have to reduce the amount and so forth. And by the way, we didn't promise people when talking to them about the result, the kind of result she was getting. We were only talking about progress. So here's the result. Here are the plans. Okay. This is what we're going to do. To you a really keep. Sorry? Re re uh, just picking up on the key point there, um, uh, John, is you know, over promising on the result there. It's, it's, it's a really big. Um, you know, a big key point for people to understand at the very start, right? I mean, I, I know I've been guilty of it myself at times, is you can overpromise at the start and then you're you're only setting up yourself for failure in the future by doing that. So um, you know, um, I'm glad you glad you made that point that, you know, the the results that you're talking about are not comparing to what exactly what the other lady got, but certainly, you know, the results of progress. The results of progress and also the the, the nature and size of their business. Um, if they've got a bigger business, mm. we we'll be able to enlarge that result. A smaller business, you know, reduce the result. The point is we're selling results. To get a result from the market, you have to sell a result to the market. Okay? They're not interested yep. in products. They're interested in productivity. So the word product is part mm. of productivity, but they're interested in productivity. They won't use that language, by the way, because no one comes to them with mm. that language. Everyone comes to them with our company. Yep. This is when we got started. It all started 20 years ago, and it started in February 1999, um, or was it March? I can't remember now. It could have been March. I'm not absolutely sure. Get on with it. What are you talking I'm not interested in all of this. Let me assume from the outset yeah. that you have a company and good product. Can you get on with it, please? My company is absolutely dependent on improvement for our customers, for our staff, for our company in terms of reputation, revenue, and everything else. So, first of all, we talk about what result we have in mind. That must have an effect on them, and it's not a lie. It must be the truth. Um, no one's saying that is exactly what will happen. You may get more. You may get less. Okay? That's not the point. The point is that you're aiming for something. And number three is control. So now what happens is we stay in touch with the customer to make absolutely sure that everything that we planned is actually happening. Okay? Very, very important. So what we used to do was say, hi, and we would ring them at a certain point. Uh, hi, it's uh, John Lees here. Um, hope everything's going well for you. I need to talk to you about the plan that we spoke about uh, just recently. Um, I can well understand if you haven't got the figures in front of you right now. So when would be a good time for me to call you so that we can discuss? Don't put them in a situation where they say, Lord, I, I, honestly, I, I haven't had a chance to look at You say it for them. You say it for them. And then mm -hmm. you come back and then you begin to talk about what's going wrong, what's going right here, and then do whatever you can to improve the situation. Okay? That's what a doctor's supposed to do, by the way. Come and see me again one month from now after you've taken these medications. You don't, you don't have to move in with me, thank you, but I want you to come back in a month and talk to me, and we'll see where you're up to. That's their job. That's our job as well. And then we have mm. the next meeting. Okay, and then we go to another month, another quarter, whatever it happens to be. The staircase plan is all about uh, helping people achieve better results. And that's all that they are interested in. They won't use that language, but believe me, that's what I'm interested in in my business. That's what you're interested in. You're looking for progress and improvement. And very few people sell progress and improvement. So I'm going to give you one last idea. Um, well, two, two last ideas, but one in particular is called the five-minute strategy. 
So if you're ringing a prospect, my advice is to say to them, um, look, I'm from, I do, uh, we are, etc. I, um, I would like to see you to talk to you about some opportunities. Um, I only need five minutes of your time. Okay, that's all. That's, that, that, that's music to their ears right from the very start. Because I can't, I can't imagine how many people go to see customers and start off hoping that they will have up to an hour or whatever it happens to be to tell them all about their company, the history of the company, the products that we've got. You know, products in and of themselves do not make success. It's the way in which we handle them, promote them, and so forth, investigate them, set goals for them, and so forth. So all, all I need is five minutes. And in that five minutes, I will establish with you what result we believe can be achieved over and above what you're currently achieving. Okay, and I hope that's of interest to you. And if it is of interest to you in the first five minutes, then I hope I can then go ahead and explain to you exactly how we would expect to achieve this result with you and for you. Okay, and I'll also explain how we stand by to make absolutely sure that the result comes out pretty much the way we said it would. Okay, so the five minute plan is very helpful. And it's, it's pretty much the reverse of what I was talking about before when I said I would see reps and then I would put my watch on for five minutes. In this instance, you're saying it to them. And if anybody had ever said that to me, I would have said, thank God for that. But they didn't. Okay. So the idea here is tell them you only have five minutes. And then if you're interested in what I have to say, and that forces you then to say to take 30 seconds to 45 seconds to tell them who you are and what you do. Okay, and they, they, they're wise people. They know what they're talking about. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, now, here's the kind of result that we believe can be achieved over and above what you're achieving now, providing that you agree that you've got an enormous amount of potential for the future. And that's all that we're interested in, is helping to convert potential into results. So, to finish, mm -hmm. as I said, any questions about any of this, just get in touch with me by email or ask Simon questions right now and so forth. Yeah, don't forget, guys, you can always drop any of these questions in the comments because that's where I, that's where we'll see it also, um, particularly even after the broadcast. And if you want to re-watch it later, um, you know, I always put the YouTube link up there in my LinkedIn profile so you can go and watch it across there. And I engage in every comment that, I have, that, that we do get. So please make sure if you've got a question, um, you can just simply leave it in the comments or like John said, he's going to give you his email at the end. You can send a question his way. You can always send me a DM and um, and I'll always reply to those and get you the information that you need. Um, just very quickly, John, before you go on to the five-minute strategy, just want to acknowledge uh, Jim Duncan, who's joining us from Queensland as well. He's just asked that very question about is the book available and at the end you'll tell everyone how they can get a copy of that book. So, um, Jim, stay tuned for that. And, uh, yeah, I'll hand it back to you, John, for the five-minute strategy. Well, I, 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 I basically have the five-minute strategy. Uh, what I want to do is just remind you of one thing behind the scenes. Take uh, the entire market. The entire market. There it is. Okay. Let us assume, because we don't know, let's assume that 50% um, – are doing okay. Uh, by okay, um, I mean that they're above where they wanted or expected to be. They're exactly where they wanted to be, or they're well ahead of where they wanted to be. Okay, 50% are doing well. And then we've got 50% that are not doing so well, not doing what they wanted to do. They're not reaching their plan. It's they're, they're just a little under their plan. They're well under their plan. Whatever it happens to be, 50% are doing okay, 50% are not doing okay. Here's my question. How many of these people here and how many of these people here want to improve their current position? Everyone. Everyone. We're sitting on a gold mine, okay, providing we sell progress and not products, okay? We charge for products, but we sell progress. So to finish, there's the book, as I said, Sell Pleasure First, Price Last. All you have to do is send me an email. My email address is, I'll put it on here so you can see it. Info at John Reeves dot com dot au. 
Okay. Info at johnlees.com.au. So if you send me an email and you've got any questions or points that you'd like to make or any um, stories that you've got to tell me, I'm always interested to hear interesting stories. I've got a whole list of them. Um, I'm writing a book on the subject at the moment. <clears throat> and um, so, as I said, you can ask for this particular book in PDF form. And then if you wish to, you can, you can then uh, distribute that to your salespeople and so forth. There is no cost involved. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and last but not least, if ever I can be of any help to you, if you're running a session for your sales team, your management team, or both, I'd be more than happy to contribute. All we have to do is talk about it, whether we're going to use Skype or Zoom or whatever it happens to be. And I'd be very pleased to make a contribution either once only uh, or on a continuing basis as we agree. But in the meantime, I want to say a special thanks again to Simon for having thought about this idea and created it and made it happen. So thanks, Simon. And uh, as he said at the beginning, we've got a number of other sessions on a weekly basis coming up, which I hope you find to be helpful. And uh, again, before the session, we will let you know what the title is so that you can see if it's going to be something of interest to you. That's me, finished. There you go. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, thank you so much, John. And just everyone out there, uh, you know, John giving these books, I know he used to sell these books because I bought them myself. Um, um, I was given some of John's early cassette tapes. So that's, you know, John's been doing this a long time and to um, offer that for free, John, I'm really grateful uh, that you've done that for the audience. And uh, very appreciative also of you making the time available to do this. Like I said, guys, at the start, I learn along with you. Um, John's a student of business. Uh, I'm a student of business. We're, we're all here to learn. And uh, today's uh, session was, uh, was, was awesome, John. So thank you so much for today's session. Like I said, every Thursday at 11 a.m., we're going to run these sessions. They'll run between 30 to 45 minutes, a bit longer, once we add a few questions and comments in. Just going to quickly acknowledge a few other people that I've noted that are watching here on LinkedIn Live. Uh, thanks, Trip Alan, uh, over in the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, Ken Dickens, Ken's featured on um, on our podcast as well, talking all things organics. I've still got the YouTube version that's got to come out on that. Um, Penny from, from our office. Uh, James Dixon, who's the General Manager of Transport and Aviation at, Australian, at Australia Post. Thank you so much, James, for joining. And, um, and Sudhu, thank you. Uh, also for joining us as well. Um, I know a couple of you have jumped over to uh, YouTube to watch this as well, so I really appreciate you guys coming on. I have noted there was a problem with the Facebook stream. Um, so I will fix that up and reset that early this morning. Um, but what I have done while John's been talking is I've shared the YouTube broadcast to Facebook as well. So, again, thanks so much for, for everyone joining us today. I hope you guys have got some value out of it. Please remember you can contact on info at John Lee's. Uh, dot com and uh, is that dot com dot au sorry john dot au uh, info i n f o at john lees all one word j o h n l e e s dot com dot au and i've got one final question to ask of everyone i know you can't all answer but here's my question if the market that you serve were to get a recording of what we've been discussing today would they approve or disapprove and there's the mm. question. Because if you say they would approve, well, then let's get on with it and make it happen. And it doesn't happen yeah, by just yeah. alone. It happens by working it all out as to how to do it. And as I said, I'm more than happy to help you with that. Yeah, abso absolutely, John. I think that's a really big key point. You know, some people, and, and myself included, we can get stuck at times instead of getting on with things. And, uh, you know, today's session has been extremely valuable. Um, guys, again, Thank you so much for tuning in today. And um, next Thursday at 11 a.m., we've got John back on. Um, I do have a list of the topics. Um, John and I will make sure we've got them in the right order for what you guys want. Please leave a comment. We'll get back to you. And then just a quick preview for next Tuesday show. Um, my Tuesday show on all things recycling is going to be talking about how we're using recycled plastic in roads. Um, the promos about uh, coming out the next uh, day or so. Um, I'm not going to give away the guests just yet, but um, that's on next Tuesday, how we're using plastic in roads, recycled plastic in roads. But next Thursday, guys, tune in. John Lees will be back. 
And, uh, yeah, we look forward to bringing you that episode next week. And uh, thank you again, John, for making your time available for us uh, in California. I look forward to catching up with you next week. We'll see you next week. Okay, thanks again. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah.